Truthfully, it's an honor. It's a privilege. Uh, I take it very serious when I have the opportunity to open God's Word with God's people on a Sunday morning. I have a tremendous value for the institution of the body of Christ, and it's, uh, it's, it's actually very intimidating to, to be responsible to bring the Word to you this morning. Uh, this morning will be uh, kind of the primary focus will be global missions. Um, I will try very hard. I'm very passionate about that. And so rather than, than preach a topic of missions, I want to stick to the truth of God's Word and do the passage of Psalm 67. Psalms is full of so many expressions of the character of God. It's full of so many expressions of, of emotions as well, and that all these things come under the care of a faithful, sovereign God. There's a bounty of praise and worship. There is so many examples of God's mercy, of begging for God's mercy, of finding all worth and value in the person and work of God in Christ. There's even prophetic psalms that point to Christ. This morning in Psalm 67, we'll see God's passion for His glory and that He be worshipped among all the nations, among all people. And it is my prayer that through this time together this morning that we would be ignited with that same passion that we would have a heart to see more and more people come before him in worship. This psalm is a prayer. It's a song. It's a prayer song. It's led by the choir master. It was likely authored by King David. The fact that it's the choir master, it's a big deal. This is for all people. This is for the, the children of Israel as, as David as their king. This psalm is a call to missions, a call to advance the gospel to every tribe, tongue, and nation to make worshipers of him. Uh, There is the most excellent modern work on missions is a book called Let the Nations Be Glad by Pastor John Piper. And this is what he says about the work of missions. Missions exist because worship does not. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It, missions, is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. Worship, therefore, is the fuel and goal of missions. It is the goal of missions because missions, in missions, we simply aim to bring the nations into the white-hot enjoyment of God. Think about that. When we use the word worship, often our default definition is the songs we sing. We'll talk about how worship was good on Sunday. What we mean is, typically, the songs were good. We liked the music. It resonated with us. But worship is so much more than that. It's an incomplete idea and understanding of worship to just limit it to to our impressions of how we're singing on a Sunday morning. Worship is the heart portrayed in song. We see that clearly over and over again in the Psalms. We see it in Colossians. But worship is the commitment of our lives to God, every aspect of our lives to God. Romans 12, think of that. Worship is the sum total of life of a Christian consumed with love for God, flowing from a faithful pursuit of Christ through his word, prayer, and service, which manifests fruitfulness produced by the Holy Spirit. Worship is singing. Worship is declaring the gospel. Worship is proclaiming God's word. Worship is a posture of the heart and service. Our lives clearly show who or what we worship. That could bring great fear upon us, or it could be very liberating to think of it that way. But we display something in how we live our lives. We display something in the words we say. We display something in our Facebook feeds. What does your life portray? What does your life show that you are worshiping? As Christians, we are not a silent people. We are people who speak, proclaim, declare, sing. We advance the gospel among all nations. We don't buy into the phrase, preach the gospel and use words if necessary. In fact, it's the exact opposite. We are people who, who should not be able to retain the words within us to proclaim the gospel. Because how will they hear if we do not proclaim it? We preach the gospel with words. We worship God before men or in front of men to a watching world. Our lives are an act of worship in the midst of the nations. Let's read. Stand with me as we read God's word, please. Psalm 67. 
to the choir master with stringed instruments, a psalm, a song. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, Selah. That your way be known on the earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth, Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Father, this morning as we dig into your word, I pray, uh, I pray that I would not get in the way of the message of, of the truth of your word, of your passion to make your name known among the nations, that there would be worshipers of every tribe, tongue, and nation. So, Father, as we work through this, by the power of your Spirit, would you do a work in our hearts because of the work that Jesus has done for us upon the cross. Father, that we would worship you before men. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. As we dig into this, there's going to be three main sections, so we'll bite it off in chunks. I'll try to provide you some direction as we go along. But first, we see the purposeful and worshipful pursuit of blessing. In verse 1, our worshipful, worshipful pursuit of God's blessing. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Think about this. The Israelites hearing this and voicing this would immediately thought of the priestly blessing when they offered sacrifices. Back in number 6, 24 to 26, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This verse is, is reaching back to that promise in Numbers and pulling it forward. Instead of the priest blessing the people by telling them what the Lord is doing, the people are now calling out to God for this blessing, but calling with assurance, calling with certainty of what he will do out of an understanding of what he has already done and what he has promised he will do. That is steadfast. That is totally God-centered. Be gracious to us. First, we recognize our need. We recognize our need for a Savior. We recognize our need for God's grace and mercy. We are desperate. We are in desperate need of Him. Worship starts with recognizing our need and the only person who can fill that need, Christ. Christians understand that apart from God, we are as dead men walking and that we need Him to breathe life into us because He is the life giver. God, be gracious to us. Bless us. Bless us with all that you promise to us in your word. We are blessed to be brought into right relationship with God through Christ. We are blessed generally each day as, as we wake and God has given us an earth that provides for us. We are blessed that God gives us all that we need for Christian life through Christ, for our spiritual needs are met in him. He provides for us, Luke 12, Matthew 6, that is God's blessing upon us. Make your face shine upon us. And now deceased pastor James Montgomery Boyce puts it this way. A shining face is the opposite of an angry or scowling face. And a face turned towards someone is the opposite of a face turned away in indifference or disgust. A shining face implies favor. And it implies the friendliness of warm, personal relationship too. We spend so much time being anxious we spend so much time worrying about our looks, our likes, our needs, our status. We strive for approval. It's built into us. We seek men rather than God. We seek the approval of men rather than God. And here we beg that God would shine his face upon us, which in Christ we know that he has made us his own. He has approved us. He looks upon us with approval. He has created us in his image. We are loved and we are known and it should stir our hearts towards worship of him alone, not the praise of men. Selah, meditate or reflect on this, our worshipful pursuit of God's blessing. But it doesn't stop there. This blessing is not something for us to squirrel away or to, to, to crave and, and find our own and, and use it for our own selves. We're not to be myopic. We're not to constantly be worrying about me. Lord, give me this. Lord, me, 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 me. 
we have a problem with that. No, this is humble. It looks towards something more. It looks towards something beyond our own needs. It looks to the needs of others. Our pursuit of God's blessing looks to the desperate need of others for the glory and worship of God. Now we have the purposeful pursuit of God's blessing. Verse 2, that your way may be known on the earth, your saving power among all nations. That, that is our purpose statement. Now here's the purpose of our pursuit of blessing, that your way may be known on the earth and your saving power among all nations. The purpose and results of hearts consumed in worship of Christ is that the world would hear the gospel proclaimed and know our great God. That is the purpose. God's way would be known on the earth. Way here means a course of life or a path. We see that throughout Scripture of God. That's what biblical theology is, is God telling us throughout Scripture continuously who He is and who we are before Him. We see it in the Great Commission in Matthew 28. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. In effect, making his way known is discipleship. It's proclaiming the truth of who God is through, through the word. It's us walking in step by the power of the Spirit with who God is through His Word, who He's revealed Himself to be, who Jesus has exemplified in His perfect life. Remember, Jesus is the what? The way, the truth, and the life. May this way be known on the earth, and that God's saving power would be known among the nations, the gospel. Consider the context of this psalm in King David. Consider the Israelites thinking about all the deliverances of God that they've experienced. They reach back into their history and they, they have these standing stones of these, these altars to God for what He has done and how He has delivered them. And He ultimately delivers them through the promise of the Messiah and the completed work of, cross, of Christ on the cross. In the larger context of Scripture, we see the ultimate saving power in that work of Christ on the cross. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. That is the good news. That is God's saving power. The gospel is God's saving power. May the gospel be known among the nations. As the gospel goes forth and people experience the the love of God and they, they, they repent and believe and they experience his saving power and they learn his way, they become true worshipers of God alone. They sing a new song, as Psalm later refers to. In verse three, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. All the peoples, not just the Israelites, all people. It is inclusive. Just as God promised Abraham in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It's been God's plan from the beginning, from from eternity, that it would not be just the Israelites, but it would be for all people of every tribe, tongue, and nation to know and worship Him. We see already earth, nations, all people. What is meant by that? Through our worshipful and loving gospel proclamation, we are extending an invitation to all peoples. What, or rather who, are the nations? Missiologists talk today about unreached people groups or unengaged people groups. They have different definitions for those things. The classical definition of unreached is people groups that have less than 2% evangelical Christian population 
And unengaged people groups are those with no evangelical church planting or similar work being done in their midst. In the modern global missions movement, we, we would be right to have the idea that there's been a lot of missions activity, particularly the last hundred years. We have numerous examples of that that I might talk about later. But our population grows and countries are not all universally accessible. Today, the world's population is about 7 billion people. 3.24 billion of these people are unreached people. That's nearly half the global population. 1.9 billion people currently have less than one-tenth of one percent of Christian witness. 1.9 billion people. The scale is just massive. The need is massive. There are even unreached people groups in North America where people are not hearing the gospel proclaimed. If you're into stats, go to joshuaproject.net that, that tracks all of the uh, statistics regarding unreached people groups. It uh, gives you ways that you can pray for them. Also, get a copy of Operation World. Go through it as a family and pray for a country a day or a country a week. Uh, I, would, I highly recommend those resources. But again, think of those numbers. Think of those statistics. Think of the needs. Think of the darkness. Over three billion people are likely not hearing Christ proclaimed. They are not singing the worship of the one true and personal God. They are plodding away to a dark and ominous tune that will crescendo in hell. Is that heavy? Declaring Christ to the nations is essential. Many are going, but many more are needed. This work is difficult. Missions is not easy. I'm sure Sam would agree with that. Adoniram Judson is, is one of my missionary heroes. Uh, there's uh, several biographies uh, on Adoniram Judson. I just read any of them. He gave his life to the people of Burma, which is modern-day uh, Myanmar. He served there until his death. He served 37 years. Back in those days, you rarely came back. You got on a boat, you went, and, and uh, rarely came back to, to where you were from. He preached, he evangelized. He, he performed an enormous amount of translation work, translated the Bible, but the cost was incredibly high. He struggled with massive health problems. He was imprisoned uh, in horrible conditions. The sickness was rampant of, of just tropical-related disease. He suffered the death of his first wife, remarried and suffered the death of his second wife and seven of his children that the world would know the gospel, that those people would be worshipers of him. There are so many others that I could commend to you, and suffering was the theme of their ministry. Amy Carmichael in India, Helen Rosevere in Congo. A lot of people don't know about her. Just Google her name and read her story. It is phenomenal. John Patton in the Cook Islands, the New Hebrides Islands, Macris Costas in Papua New Guinea and Greece, excellent biography. Uh, talk to me afterwards, I'll tell you where to get it. So many more. Read their stories and pray for more workers in the harvest like them. Maybe that's you. Many today are giving their lives to proclaim the gospel, and their obedience to that call is costly. Yet they love the Lord and are passionate for lost souls to hear the gospel, for lost souls to be invited into the worship chorus of, of God, their pursuit of God's blessing for the purpose of global gospel advance is humbling. Can you imagine ministering in India right now where literally the smell of death is in the air? What was already an incredibly difficult and challenging work there, which I'm sure Sam and Amy could tell you about, the suffering and the darkness and the hopelessness right now is off the charts. We should pray that, that God would strengthen his churches, his gospel ministers there, and use them in such a time as this to bring light into that darkness. What an amazing opportunity, but what intense suffering. I will tell you that even missionaries here that Grace supports, there's things that go on in their families and in their lives that we don't know about, that you wouldn't necessarily know about, but I'll name a few that I know about. Recently, one of our missionaries' fathers passed away suddenly. 
a brother took his own life. Countries have had their borders closed, preventing continued ministry. It has uprooted missionaries. Others have had to change ministries completely. These are not just job changes. These are culture changes. These are heavy investment of life and family that change overnight in some cases. Multiple health challenges, some very serious. Depression, loss, and the list goes on. Missionary kids are often forgotten. I have five. And I'm not saying they're forgotten, but they live between two worlds. The sacrifice goes beyond the dad or the mom and the work they do. The sacrifice goes into the children as they can't fully identify with their passport country and they can't fully acculturate to their new country and they live what's called a third culture in between. Uh, It makes for an odd group of kids. I'm an MK. I I get it. I'm a... I'm a product of that third culture. It is hard. Often you don't feel like you fit. But I'm so proud for the evidence of faith in my children's lives as they persevered in the midst of making sense of of the lives that God has called us to. But be aware of the family as, as a whole of missionaries. Complexity of these struggles is exponential when you cross cultures when you're living in a culture not your own, separated by thousands of miles from family and resources. Most missionaries rely on shepherding and eldering care not in the country they're in, but back home in the church that sent them. But God is rich in mercy. Those who go are giving up much and have sacrificed so much for the sake of the gospel that it would be known among the nations, raising up disciples to sing the chorus of the new song, But their prayer is verses 1 and 2. Lord, be gracious to us that your saving power would be known among the nations. We pray for God's blessing that it would result in the advance of the gospel in the nations. To the praise and glory and worship of God. This is the purposeful and worshipful pursuit of blessing for the nations to know and worship God. And we move to verses four and five, which is a a doubling down on this prayer, purpose, and praise idea. And we see confidence in the sovereignty of God produces praise. Confidence in the sovereignty of God produces praise. Verse four, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Notice the word let, God do this. Again, God works to the glory of his name for worship of him alone. And gladness and joy here are, in the Hebrew, are are emphatic expressions. They're not just like, yeah, I'm glad I woke up this morning, or, oh, that was a really joyful ride on the roller coaster. This This is off the charts. This is consuming of our heart and mind. These are not just happy little thoughts and words of a heart that is cool to the greatness and glory of God but hearts that are on fire that can do nothing but praise and worship their God. That is the idea of the joy in God. Pause for a moment. Does that reflect our our urgency and fervency in worship, whether sung or otherwise? Does that reflect our view of the faith that God has given us? Let's look further. Sovereignty of God, he is king. Why this gladness and joy? For you judge and guide. Because the Lord is king, he reigns, he is sovereign. He judges the peoples with equity and guides the nations. He is in control and he's a king who guides with perfect wisdom and providence. The sovereignty of God exercised out of perfect love, grace, mercy, and justice should lead us to rejoice but it should also remind us of the needs of the lost, their need for the gospel. Psalm 96 is another missions-oriented. It's referred to as a kingly psalm. And after a a similar expression of singing and declaring the gospel, in Psalm 96, 13, we read this. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in faithfulness. He comes, for he comes. 
It's the promise of the future. It's the prophecy of Jesus will return and all of us will stand for account of everything. All will stand to account for every part of our lives. But because of the gospel, because of what Jesus has done by grace through faith, we are saved from God's wrath. Because there is salvation from sin's curse, we are on a mission to spread the gospel as far as we can that many would be saved. God will judge the world in perfect righteousness and faithfulness and equity. Those who are his, who have faith in Christ, will have Christ's righteousness accounted to you. You will wear the robe of Christ's righteousness. And those who are apart from God will know something else. They will come with their own righteousness, but they will be given payment, an eternal payment of judgment. Think of that. That is a somber reminder, but we know the remedy. Our sovereign king is gracious and good, offers redemption, offers life. That is our confidence. Confidence in the sovereignty of God and his unchanging ways produces praise, praise and worship. Christian, this understanding of God's justice, of his goodness, of his grace, of his mercy should cause our hearts to soar in thankfulness and praise. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Our perfectly loving God, the God of the universe, set his affection on us individually, specifically, He has called us by name. He has known us from the foundations of the world. He judges and he protects us. He guides not only us but the nations. All the world is under his guidance and care, his sovereign guidance and care. God gives us gladness and joy in and through the work of the gospel. Selah. Rest and meditate with confidence in your sovereign king of kings. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Verse 5. God, you are king. You are good. You are gracious. Worship and praise is again emphasized here. We praise him. We are filled with gladness and joy. Our praises invite the nations in through the proclamation of the gospel. We worship God before men to extol the great virtues of God, the life giver. Confidence in the sovereignty of God produces praise among all peoples. We now transition to the final two verses. The first five have focused on this pattern of prayer and purpose and praise, and they double down on each other, an emphasis in praise and worship out of a response for what God will do and does. And we see eternal blessing, holy fear, and the conquering gospel. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. We are blessed forever. In verse 6, we see God in his sovereign grace blesses us with all we need. The earth provides our physical or, or temporal needs as part of the providence of God for us. Again, think Luke 12 or Matthew 6, how, how God provides everything for us. There's nothing to be anxious for. Take no thought uh, or worry about tomorrow. And then it says, our God, our God will bless us. There's a certainty there, but don't miss the personal and relational God that we have. Our blessing is based on the promises of God and the work of Christ. Those are eternal. Those are unfailing. Those are personal. He relates with his people. All that God has done for us in Christ is unfathomably glorious. He provides for the temporal and earthly needs and blesses us in this way, but he also provides everything we need for today. His grace was there yesterday. We can see evidence of grace yesterday. We experience the present grace of Christ. And through his promises, we trust in the future grace of God in Christ. We are eternally blessed forever. Next we see holy fear, verse seven. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. 
This is not a fear of death or destruction. This is a fear of reverence and awe. We're used to those words when we talk about fearing God, but let's, let's go a little deeper in that. We reflect on the works of God. We reflect on his deeds. We reflect on the perfection of his character. We reflect on his goodness. And we cannot help but to stand amazed and to worship him in humble adoration. And again, back to, to Psalm 96, verse 9. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness Tremble before him all the earth. The words for worship, tremble, and fear often are very similar to the effect of being in awe, but Spurgeon says this, Charles Spurgeon says this, tremble is the word in the original and it ex expresses the profoundest awe just as, as the word worship does, which would be more accurately translated by bow down. Now get this. Even the bodily frame would be moved to trembling and prostration if men were thoroughly conscious of the power and glory of Jehovah. Even the bodily frame would be moved to trembling and prostration if men were thoroughly conscious of the power and glory of Jehovah. What a grand scale of worship and awe. It's like we see in Isaiah 6, 1 through 7. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. What a scene of the holiness of God. That is powerful. We see his holiness, his mercy, and his grace that we cannot withhold our worship and awe. We cannot be silent. We are welling up with worship and praise in holy fear and awe. Lastly, the conquering gospel. Verses 6 and 7 are a present reality for believers of the blessing of salvation, but also of the future blessing of eternity with him, worshiping him with people of every tribe, tongue, and nation. Each of these verses is rooted in absolute certainty of, of what is being asked of God. It will be done. God will be worshiped by every tribe, tongue, and nation through the power of the gospel. The gospel is all-conquering. Nothing can prevent the work of God in the gospel. Through faith in Christ, we are more than conquerors because Jesus secured all of the blessings for us. He has made us worshipful instruments for the advance of the gospel among the nations. God has called us to a life of gospel-advancing worship. He's given us his Holy Spirit to, to help us. I think we can see how God-centered missions is. It's us pleading with him. It's him wanting to work. It's him doing everything and making us a part of that for his glory and for his worship. We are calling on his promises to equip and bless us so that his way and saving power are known among the nations. And as he is known, he is worshiped. The gospel is unfailing. It is steadfast. It is victorious. So often we get in the way of the gospel. We don't share the gospel because of fear. Oh, I don't have all the answers. We should have confidence in the gospel. It is a conquering gospel. 
And he's given us so much in his word to affirm that to us, for us to be faithful to the gospel message. We are not all Bible answer men. And if we took it seriously, we would pursue men like Sam Raju. We'd ask him to help us understand how can we communicate the gospel more effectively? How can we grow in this area? But if we aren't in the practice of sharing the gospel, and if we aren't having a mindset that this is the conquering gospel, we will continue in our weakness. Oh, that we would see how powerful the gospel is and that we would live in that way. Christian, as we wake each day and lay our heads down each night, may we be confident in the power of the gospel to save. If you're a Christian here today, it's the gospel that saved you. May we be pursuing the blessings of the gospel for the purpose of proclaiming the gospel to the nations, that the nations would praise and worship the one true God. I pray that we would worship the Lord with the entirety of our lives. Our words, our songs, our finances, our service, our bodies, through the power and confidence of our conquering gospel. A couple of points, three points of application to, to hopefully be an encouragement to you. First, know the gospel. Know what God has done for you in the gospel. Study his word. If, if you need discipleship, pursue it. The elders, community group leaders are happy to provide that, to walk this life with you, to encourage you in that, but know the gospel. If we are, as Christians, by nature, we are to be gospel messengers, then we should know the gospel. Understand the gospel in all its glory, strength, and beauty, the works of God, all of these things that you proclaim about your God. Second, worship the Lord with your life. Some should be giving their lives to, co to cross-cultural missions, proclaiming the gospel to all peoples. Some should be devoted to local gospel work. Some should be senders. You either go or you send. I, 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 John Piper has advocated for this for, for decades. We're either senders or we're goers. Whichever of those we are, we are to do it worshipfully. We are to do it with full commitment for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the nations. Third, this might seem self-serving, but send and support the goers. Just as those who go sacrifice much, so do we as we become their strong support. Our role, the role of the body of Christ, is to sacrificially support the goers. Give sacrificially whatever is needed. It's not, it's not only finances. It's not, it's not about that. Some need counseling. Some need teachers. Some need other resources or clothing or a car or whatever it may be. They need people interceding on their behalf, people committed to praying for their every need. Give generously of your time and faithfully in support of God's work. Part of that is know who they are. Know their names. If I were to ask for the names of the missionaries on the board outside the wall here, how many of you would know their names? How many of you would know their children's names? This task is serious for the body of Christ. Pray with intention and in detail for them. In 2016, Grace Bible Church held a commissioning service to send our family to Ukraine. At the end of this, the service, the story of Andrew Fuller and William Carey was told. These are two missionary heroes. Look them up as well. We had come forward and the elders had invited anybody who wanted to to come and lay hands on us and pray for us. And it was, uh, there's a picture of it. It was a, not a dry eye in the house. Uh, I had more hands on me <laughs> than I care to remember. But the moment was so, so pivotal. And the analogy is the hold the rope analogy. 
Andrew Fuller had said, there is a gold mine in India, but it seems as deep as the center of the earth. Who will venture to explore it? I will go down, responded William Carey. And in words that will never be forgotten, he said, but remember that you must hold the rope. Some are holding the ropes of missionaries. Some are the missionaries on the other end. But we are all involved in the mission's endeavor. Make sure you are holding the end of the rope with worshipful abandon for the gospel. I, on a a couple of occasions early on in the struggle of of our ministry in Ukraine, I got random texts. Uh, One of them was as simple as this, Justin, I'm holding the rope. Simple words, a simple text. I cannot tell you how vital that was. Around that same time was a dark night of the soul in in ministry and life and family in Ukraine. And I've never shared this publicly, but I woke up one night weeping, which I'm not a weeper, uh, just overwhelmed by the the, the work that God had called us to. And I texted Calvin. And it was when the song, Christ is Mine Forevermore, had just been released by City of Light, the song we sang right before I came up. That song spoke to me verse by verse, and it drove me to God's word, and it drove me to peace in him at one o'clock in the morning as I wrestled with the Lord until 5 a.m. That's holding the rope. The ultimate result of missions is Revelation 7, 9 through 12. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, standing before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Some of you have had the privilege to be in a cross-cultural setting and worship with believers of another tribe, tongue, and nation. Some of you have had the opportunity to do that in multiple different cultures, and you can imagine just a glimpse of, of what the new heaven and new earth will be like as we experience this. What a beautiful thing. Friends, there is a vast sea of lost souls on this earth who will be judged. It is our privilege and calling to declare Christ among the nations to the billions, so the billions more would be written in the Lamb's book of life. And billions join us in the new song of praise to our Lord representing the glory and honor of the nations in the city yet to come, in his kingdom forever. Let's pray. Father, we do ask, we beg of you to use us in whatever way to be ministers of the gospel, to to invite the lost into this new song that the nations would cry out in gladness and joy before you glory and honor be to our God forever and ever amen